In the second set of videos on the second law of thermodynamics, we're going to refocus on chemical systems and learn about Gibbs free energy and how to think about spontaneity and chemical reactions in terms of Gibbs free energy. But before getting there, we're going to take a look at the third law of thermodynamics and what are called standard entropies. Entropy is denoted with a capital S, and just like all of the capital letters in thermodynamics, it's a state function. This means that we can do the same thing with entropy that we've done with enthalpy thus far. We can take a set of processes whose delta S's are known, add them together, and the corresponding sum of the delta S's will be equal to delta S for the sum of the processes. This is essentially Hess's law applied to the state function entropy. We could set out then to define standard entropy changes of formation, delta S, say, sub M, sub F, using an analogy to the standard enthalpies. However, if we pause for a moment and think about this, we don't actually have to do this because Boltzmann's statistical definition of entropy gives us an absolute zero of entropy. Remember that according to Boltzmann, S is proportional to the natural log of W, and so when W is equal to one, well then S is strictly equal to zero. So we should be able to determine entropy in an absolute sense. This seems to set an absolute zero of entropy. But the trick to this is appreciating and understanding the situation when W actually equals one. Remember, for a typical macroscopic thermodynamic system, W is massively, massively huge. So under what conditions, under what circumstances, is W equal to one? Well, if we can locate and understand this absolute zero of entropy. Well, then we can work with absolute entropies without worrying about entropy changes or standard en entropy changes. So let's try to understand the absolute zero of entropy and W equals one in a little more detail. To shed some light on this, let's think about the Boltzmann distribution as a function of temperature. In the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, I've got Boltzmann distributions at a variety of temperatures. The ones that are far out to the right are high temperature distributions, and as we lower the temperature, we can see that not only is the maximally likely energy decreasing, but it's becoming more likely and more likely. And so there's this kind of exponential move towards higher and higher likelihood for the lowest energy state. The peaks become sharper and sharper at ever lower energy as we lower the temperature down. All of these peaks correspond to lower and lower temperatures. The standard deviation of the distribution decreases, and S decreases as a result, since a smaller number of energy states are occupied with more particles. You can imagine continuing this trend until we get to T equals zero, at which point all of the particles have the same energy and they're all at E equals zero. Now, with all particles in the same energy, we can ask the fundamental question that allows us to get at W, how many ways are there to put, say, n particles in a thermodynamic system in one energy level? Well, no matter the value of n, we can draw an analogy, for example, to throwing n particles all in one box when there are, for example, four possible boxes. There's only one way to do this, no matter the value of n. It's n things taken in at a time, right? In that case, w equals one and s is equal to zero. What we're seeing then is as the temperature decreases, the entropy tends to zero. The Boltzmann distribution tightens up, and once it reaches zero, at zero Kelvin, we have all the particles in the same energy state, E equals zero. This was recognized by Nernst, and he proposed the third law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero K is equal to zero. Now, what do we mean exactly by perfect crystal? Clearly, the atoms cannot be moving, if they're moving, then we'll have some distribution of speeds, as we've seen before, and so we can imagine just a perfectly stationary lattice of particles like this. But perfect crystal goes even beyond this idea of stationary molecules that are regularly arranged. A perfect crystal is such that there is only one lowest energy level in the system. That means that there can be no degeneracy in the lowest levels. We've seen degeneracy, for example, in the atomic orbitals. The two p atomic orbitals, there are three of them, and so we say that this is threefold degenerate. There are three orbitals at the same energy level. In a perfect crystal, there can be no degeneracy because in that case, we would see some entropy, for example, right? If the probability of being in this orbital is 0.33, and this orbital is 0.33, and this orbital is 
Well, then entropy is non-zero according to Boltzmann's definition, right? There must be only one lowest energy level in a perfect crystal. Given the statistical definition of entropy and our intuitive notion what happens to the system as it cools down, that is, the particles slowing down and organizing themselves, this law should make pretty good sense. But what we can do with it now is we can define absolute entropies for all substances, even the elements, relative to the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. We can write what are called standard entropies or standard molar entropies on a per mole basis. This is in many ways conceptually simpler than relying on, for example, entropies of formation. Standard molar entropy, S sub m, is the entropy of a substance at one bar of pressure and a specified temperature, which for us will be 298 Kelvin unless otherwise spe specified. These are the standard conditions that are denoted by this little circle. And the standard molar entropy is defined relative to a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. In fact, we can envision a process that corresponds to the standard molar entropy. In other words, we can envision a process whose delta S is equal to the standard molar entropy. To think about that, let's think about what happens to entropy as temperature increases. If we plot entropy on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis, thinking back to what we just saw with the Boltzmann distribution at zero Kelvin, the entropy is zero, ignoring some complications with degeneracy that happen for certain systems. But let's keep things simple and imagine that at zero Kelvin, the entropy is zero. At one bar of pressure, as we increase the temperature and heat the substance, we are increasing its entropy to a point. In fact, for each step along this climb in temperature, what we can say is that ds is equal to del q rev divided by t. We've seen that before, but del q rev we can get from the definition of heat capacity and say that the heat capacity at constant pressure Cp dt divided by t is equal to ds. And so simply by increasing the temperature of the substance and seeing where the entropy ends up, integrating over all of these, adding up all the teeny tiny changes in entropy ds, we get to the standard molar entropy S sub m. And really, although we've introduced the third law of thermodynamics, standard molar entropy is still a measure of energy dispersal. Our conceptual definition of entropy still applies. It's going to be greater for substances that have greater mass, more modes of energy storage, and less condensed phases. So less condensed phases should make intuitive sense. The idea that a gas containing particles spread out over, for example, the volume of an entire container has higher entropy than, for example, a solid, which is a pile of molecules in a regular close pattern with one another. That should make sense. But what about greater mass and more modes of energy storage? Well, let me talk about the second one first, actually. The units of entropy are joules per Kelvin, energy per temperature. In a sense, we can imagine that a molecule that has many different ways to translate, rotate, vibrate, etc., has different places to put energy that's dispersed within it. And of course, the same idea applies to the bulk substance. If I have, for example, five different rotational modes, well, I can store energy in any of these five different rotational modes. That corresponds to greater energy dispersal, meaning that the, the entropy of the system is greater. Greater mass is not quite this simple, but we can think on a basic level that entropy is extensive. And so for a system with greater mass, even on the molecular level, entropy is going to be larger. Let's look at some examples to bring these ideas into a little more focus. First of all, let's compare solids, liquids, and gases for similar substances. A nice example is provided by the halogen. So solid I2 has an entropy of about 116.1 joules per Kelvin per mole. It should be noted that these are joules per Kelvin per mole, relatively small numbers when we compare to, for example, enthalpies of formation, which are usually in the kilojoules. When we move to liquid bromine, we get a much larger entropy, 152.2 joules per Kelvin per mole. And then when we move to gaseous fluorine, we're up to 202.8 joules per Kelvin per mole. So from solid to liquid to gas, we're increasing in entropy. Notice also that within the diatomic gases, as we move down group 17, from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, we get higher and higher entropies, 202, 223, 245, 260. Entropy is increasing with molecular mass. 
A very interesting example comes in the triatomic gases, where we can think about molecular shape and the number of rotations available to these types of molecules and how that influences entropy. So, for example, if we compare O3, which is a bent molecule, to N2O, which as it happens is a linear molecule, or to CO2, which is also linear, what we find is that CO2 and N2O have lower entropies, lower standard molar entropies, than O3. Why is this? Part of the reason has to do with the fact that O3 is bent and has access to a rotation along an axis this way that actually causes the molecule to look different. That same rotation in either of these linear molecules is just going to spin the molecule around an axis of symmetry and not move any of the atoms. This additional rotation causes this entropy for O3 to be greater than the entropies of N2O and CO2. We can notice a similar effect if we compare a diatomic gas with a monatomic gas of similar mass. The combined mass of an F2 molecule is about 38 atomic mass units, and we can see that's on par with the atomic mass of the monatomic gas, argon. The two masses are about the same, so we might expect the entropies to be about the same, especially given the fact that both of these are gases. But if we look at what the entropy of F2 is relative to argon, we find 202.8 for gaseous F2 and for monatomic argon gas only 154.8. Quite a large difference in entropy. We can explain the greater entropy in the case of F2 by the fact that it has many different types of energy storage modes available to it relative to the monatomic gas. So argon is simply a bunch of spherical atoms, so the atoms themselves can't rotate or vibrate or do anything like that. F2, on the other hand, has a variety of ways to store or disperse energy. It can vibrate, the FF bond can vibrate, it can rotate in two different directions. These additional means of storing energy lead to a higher value of standard molar entropy for F2 relative to monatomic argon gas. With these standard molar entropies in hand, we can now assemble entropy changes of reaction, delta SM of reaction. The idea is to apply the same sort of Hess's law type concept to the absolute now standard molar entropies. We subtract the entropies of all the reactants from those of all the products. Delta S of reaction is equal to the sum over all the products of the standard molar entropies minus the sum over all the reactants of their standard molar entropies, and here, as before, it's very important to respect stoichiometry. That means if you have a coefficient of, say, 2 or 3 in front of a product, you need to multiply its standard molar entropy by that corresponding coefficient when doing this calculation. 